Along with Dr. David Johnson, Professor of Medicine and Chief of Gastroenterology in Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, alpha-gal syndrome is something hopefully you've heard about. If you haven't, you need to know about it. And the AGA has re recently just posted a practice update on alpha-gal for the GI clinician. I want to give you some highlights from this. First of all, the alpha-gal syndrome is recognizably an emerging allergy that was first described early in the 2000s. The allergy can actually cause anaphylaxis, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, and skin symptoms within a couple hours of the ingestion of mammalian products. There seems to be, however, a GI phenotype that increasingly is apparent that has fairly nonspecific symptoms, including abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, without the predominant skin or respiratory or circulatory symptoms. So again, the focus here from the AGA perspective is to look at the GI aspect of this. The allergy in alpha-gal is, is to galactose alpha-1,3-galactose, which is an oligosaccharide on the cells of the non-primate, uh, of all non-primate animals. So this is something that you think about animal, animal mammals that have hair. Uh, surprisingly, the sensitization comes through a exposure via a tick bite in the United States, at least in particular. The lone star tick has been predicated as far as the implication, and this is predominantly in the Midwest. Uh, to the east, uh, the only exclusion may be the far northeast uh, as far as reported cases, but a vast uh, majority of these cases are within that uh, territory. Now, the antigen to alpha-gal is absorbed by the GI tract and bound to a fat in uh, glycolipid and incorporated into collimicrons, and this enters the GI system and then into the blood within two hours. Uh, when the antigen binds these IgA antibodies, uh, present on mast cells that are so richly populating the GI tract, these mast cells then degranulate and they release their mediators, uh, including histamines and other mediators, that can create significant effects on sensory nerve endings, uh, intestinal smooth muscle the function, creating contractility or mucus glands to secrete mucus. The observational studies have really suggested that there is a particular association with these mammalian dietary-related uh, products precipitating these events. Now, most individuals with alpha-gal antibodies in the population are asymptomatic. Uh, uh, article from the folks at North Carolina, University of North Carolina, EPUB, it'll come out later in 2023, actually looked at a cross-sectional study of patients that were undergoing screening colonoscopy, and they found that the majority of the patients that were positive, about a third of the patients were positive in their, in their epidemiologic evaluation, uh, did not manifest uh, symptoms. So again, there seems to be a phenotype of people that are more pre predisposed to the reaction as it relates to the alpha-gal syndrome. Now, the initial understanding of the significance significance of alpha-gal actually started with the investigation of some immediate and oftentimes severe re allergic reactions, particular to a monoclonal antibody, which is uh, cetuximab or aribitux, uh, which is something that, that is used in our field in gastroenterology for colon cancer and ENT for head and neck cancers. Uh, in particular, this is a monoclonal antibody derived from urine antibodies, uh, but is a, 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 a epidermal growth factor interferent type uh, interaction. But there seems to be a proclivity for interactions as it relates to the uh, alpha-gal syndrome. So when should the gastroenterologist consider alpha-gal in the differential diagnosis? Well, the pr proposal would be that keep it on the plate for really unexplained GI symptoms, particularly abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, particularly those that have lived or have lived in the alpha-gal alpha -gal predominant areas, which you mentioned from the Midwest all the way to the East Coast, uh, across Southeast, Central Atlantic, and then uh, uh, Mid-Atlantic and uh, Northern, up to the, uh, the far Northeast, perhaps being a little bit less likely. Now, the clinicians shouldn't not, should consider not testing those with red flag symptoms, in particular people that have anemia, GI bleeding, weight loss. The allergy doesn't cause these type of symptoms. So those things, again, would be alarm features that would talk about diagnostic testing, not testing for alpha-gal. Now, the Lone Star tick is something that predominates in the U.S., uh, but the syndrome has also been recognized, and it's important for the people that are listening around the world on this, that this has been reported in Australia, South Africa, Western Europe, and even Japan. The characteristics of this uh, really are something that are striking in, in the patients that report nocturnal awakening from GI distress. 
particularly because of this two or more hour ingestion related type exposure and the degranulation, the histamines that we talked about in the uh, in the small intestine. Now, how is this diagnosed? Well, the diagnosis is really made by an alpha-gal IgE titer, and, uh, and then in response to this, as we would do with celiac testing, response to a diet. So an IgE antibody to alpha-gal is not enough to establish a diagnosis, particularly in patients uh, with isolated GI or distress. So these patients should be directed uh, towards a dietitian, hopefully, uh, to particular get a dietary avoidance, and this really should focus on things like mammalian diet, this would be beef, pork, venison, and related products also coming from mammalian uh, type of derivatives, lard, dairy, ice cream, and this should be followed for at least a month as it relates to this. And it's very important as we do with our celiac patients to caution them to avoid eating at restaurants for this time because you can easily cross-contaminate food, processed foods, and some of these may be food additives that otherwise may be missed. Now, the management of this uh, is really the directive of uh, the diet, and, and patients should be counseled to not eat the pork, beef, venison, and other mammalian meat. So in essence, any animal with hair, uh, but in particular, as well as products made from these animals, such as lard, butter, milk, and others, these should be avoided. Dairy does contain small amounts of alpha-gal, particularly things like ice cream and, and cream and cream cheese. And they have a high fat content, which also seems to be a very provocative for the alpha-gal syndrome uh, as it relates to the animals that contain this high fat content. Important to recognize, too, gelatin is a derivative from the collagen in pig or cow bones. As such, things that contain gelatin, such as marshmallows or gummy bears or gelatin candies and desserts, and some medications, in particular things like ibuprofen, uh, some of the acetaminophen derivatives, uh, clonidine, uh, lisinopril, these have been listed as uh, using gelatin in the process. So it should be important to at least look at the medications that patients are taking, not only prescription Rx, but also over the counter. There have been some patients that have reported reactions also from just the inhalation of the alpha-gal, for example, frying bacon or beef products. So again, these may be things to counsel the patients about. And it is important to recognize that if you have a, a reaction to, as an alpha-gal syndrome, uh, the patients be instructed to take one or two diphenhydramine, typically 25 milligram tablets, so 25 to 50 milligrams. Make sure they have access to an injectable EpiPen if they're really severe anaphylactic type reactions. What do you counsel to patients that have alpha-gal syndrome? Well, first, the diet we talked about, make sure it's the correct diagnosis, but it's very important to counsel them about measures to avoid further tick bites because additional tick bites seem to upregulate the sensitivity for the allergic reaction. So patients should be performing tick checks when showering soon after activities in wooded areas. Uh, things I learned in Boy Scouts uh, 50 years ago now, look at the idea of pulling up barriers around your, your pants, in particular socks being pulled up over the pant cuffs on hikes and treating clothes and boots. It's, uh, the permethrin uh, it certainly helps reduce the tick bites. Um, the the infusion that we saw with uh, sertuximab and the alpha-gal certainly had uh, a, a reason to make patients aware of this as uh, potentially in the oncologists that are using these things. Uh, derivatives of things like pancreatic enzymes also important because these are made from, from uh, pigs and they may cause problems in allergic individuals. Regarding medical devices, uh, the alpha-gal uh, re reaction allergic has shown uh, potential to uh, create a problem with bioprosthetics, bovine or porcine. This includes cardiac valves, uh, patches, veins in vitro. Although there are no long-term studies on this, or at least two cases that were reported as far as anaphylactic reactions after a bioprosthetic valve replacement in alpha-gal patients so that were allergic. There are products out there as far as alpha-gal free medical devices. So again, something that your transplant people or vascular surgeons should be aware of, in particular if you're in an endemic area and patients may be showing this proclivity. So how should the gastroenterologist follow up patients with alpha-gal? Well, it's important to recognize, first of all, alpha-gal gal is a dynamic condition. So symptoms may fluctuate over time. The patients who take the avoidance to avoid tick bites and whose sensitization fades over time may ultimately be able to eat meat in the future, uh, whereas additional tick bites do heighten the sensitization. And again, it's extremely important to make this 
that are mandatory for the patients. They really need to avoid further tick bites. If the patients are doing well, the recommendation is to repeat the alpha-gal IgE levels in 6 to 12 months. And if the level decreases or is negative, the patient may be able to try resuming. The recommendation is first to begin with dairy products and then mammalian meat products, but initially with small portions. Anybody that has significant symptomatic reactions uh, should then work for their, with their allergist and certainly have availability of antihistamines and the injectables that we talked about with epinephrine. When should they be referred to an allergist? The recommendation is if the patients are more severe and they have the skin or systemic findings that you would expect with more anaphylaxis. Uh, the, there's no data that we're aware of that any allergists have established a desensitization protocol, protocol for alpha-gal. So again, this would be working with uh, ways to avoid problems and progression of the allergic response. So uh, what happens if the patients are having an allergic reaction? Uh, do they anticipate that it will always happen after every exposure? And the answer there is no. There are certain factors that seem to heighten the phenotypic expression. In particular, we mentioned earlier, fattier cuts of meat seem to be cofactors, uh, non-steroidals, uh, alcohol may increase the, the reaction potential. And the other question is, are there other consequences beyond the GI track, and there are some reports that the IgE-associated positive patients have an increased proclivity for uh, advanced cardiac disease. So again, be something to watch for at this point. There are no significant uh, screening recommendations outside of normal clinical practice. So the take-home message is that I would leave you with. First, gastroenterologists should be aware of the diagnosis, the management, and in particular, the emphasis on prevention of further tick bites, exposures. Recognize this is a U.S. Lone Star tick, but there are areas all around the world that are reporting this as well. So keep that in your differential. Uh, avoidance of repetitive tick bites, decreasing sensitization, and counseling, in particular, talking about the dietary medication-related type exposures and things that you may not only focus on prescription, but non-prescription, restaurant exposures, et cetera. So keep it on your list of differential. It's an important disease with a lot of different, very, very protean manifestations that overlap with a lot of disease states that we deal with, including functional diseases in the U.S. It may not help you functional. We may, may be able to do better when we really focus on the underlying etiology. And Dr. David Johnson, thanks again for listening.